Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Damian Wetzel, director of the Aspen Institute Arts Program. Uh, and we're here today celebrating uh, one of our Harmon Eisner artists in residence, the great actor, Alfre Woodard. Uh, I should say the, the Harmon Eisner Artisan Residence Program uh, started in 2006, and since then it has grown in, in uh, scale uh, and in variety of artists represented. And the, the point of it from the beginning, as envisioned by the late Sidney Harmon and Michael Eisner, was to bring the arts and artists and artistic mentality back into the great conversation of the Aspen Institute. So what does that mean? It means specifically that what we're not here to do is to get a great actor or dancer or musician to come here and do a gig, to come and play, to come and do their stuff, strut their stuff. What we are here to do is to take that artistic sensibility and bring people who are engaging through their art in society, in diplomacy, in education, in economic development, in activism. Uh, and we have with us uh, in Alfre Woodard one of the great activists of our time, uh, a true cha change agent, someone who believes in uh, making a difference. And so I thought we'd just start right there. Uh, you told us earlier in the education panel uh, that it was, it sounds like it was in the DNA of Tulsa where you grew up, that if you were uh, a young African-American woman, you either had to be, you said, numbed out or you were an activist. Um, somehow I think you took that to another place, but tell us about that, what that felt like, if you would. You know, you're a, you're a little girl, and you're already thinking these things? You're not just thinking I need to have a nice day, <laughs> have some fun with my dolls, whatever, play. Oh, I wasn't a doll person. No dolls, okay, yeah. whatever it Can was. Can you take me down just a bit? I, I have a pretty big voice, thanks. Um, I'm reminded, just as you said that, my father, uh, M.H. Woodard, and my mom was Constance, a lot of that comes from who they are. Um, my father's people were landowners. They ran for land when Oklahoma became a territory. And my mother's people were sharecroppers in Texas. And so these are big families. And uh, there's something I think about um, working the land that that you cannot deny your interconnectedness to other people so you know you put your crop in and it's the luck of the draw whether yours comes up that year or what happens and if somebody's failed somebody within shouting distance it's it's incumbent on, uh, upon everybody to make sure that that family eats that year not the cast off but has the same thing to eat that your family does because it's just you, you it, it's demonstrated to you constantly when you work the land that that you are all equal absolutely equal and so it, i i came up they lived in the city i mean we were raised in the city but i think it's that sensibility of uh that you everybody has to take care of each other and I feel grateful I was on the end to help take care of somebody rather than being on the other end. Mm -hmm. I also, my father, during the Depression, uh, his mother, because his father um, died when he was very young, and he, um, she had 12 kids. And my father remembers and talks about uh, being a young black boy. His mom was a little uh, Irish woman, half black, half Irish, and she had all these Amazonian kids. and. They would, you know, they, 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 their farm kept producing well, no matter what was happening. And he talked about seeing people come through and helping his mother fill buckets of, of what we then, back then they called hobos. And my father would always said, you know, they said those were hobos. Those weren't hobos. Those were some, those were some people's fathers out, you know, just out trying to make a way. Uh, some people's mm -hmm. brothers, but so having that experience to, to be filling the bucket of white men who are coming to ask his little black mother for assistance, but in the same county, you could get strung up as a young black boy for any number of things. He and his brothers were protected because my grandmother was formidable, mm -hmm. but I mean, it's all that kind of strange relationships that we all have, especially in the South back then. But so they came Sounds into like, the city I mean, with that. I hear like 
a level of ownership. You were a part of the land. You took responsibility for it. You took responsibility for your neighbors. And that was in your DNA growing up. But yeah, and what they came into the city, my father did very well. And even among the- What did he do? He was, a, he was an interior decorator mm -hmm. and a businessman and an oil man. See, back then, some of y'all are old enough here to remember it, black men always had two and three jobs. Mm -hmm. Even if you were a doctor, you had two more jobs on the side, the lawyers. It was just, it was that you just, you just worked. You just found, if there was time to do something you, and you saw a need, you say, you know what, Let's, why don't we open a nursing mm -hmm. home? Why don't we do this? And so there was all that kind of activity. But, um, but my, uh, I have to tell you this, my father would shout us in every day because you know, you're running around and my mother would always say, ooh, you smell fresh, you smell like outdoors. It's like when you're running and playing and you come inside. We would be yelled inside to come every day at six o'clock and watch Mrs. Douglas Edwards with the news. I can remember my first being five and just standing there and you're itching because you were playing in the chiggers and you'd, you'd, you'd stand there, the three of us, and we'd have to watch the news every day with him. Mm -hmm. And then he would ask you what you thought about the news. So it was, it was, it was always, uh, I had an idyllic childhood, but absolutely aware, made aware of what was going on in the world. Wow. And then yourself, you know, coming from the so at five, you're scratching and watching, but absorbing and being forced to give your opinion and, and then wanting to give your opinion to what you described as walking precinct at 10. Uh, to me, these are formative experiences that, yeah, never you know, you don't really, that. they get in your, in your head and that becomes, it's, it seems perfectly natural then, you know, what's come after as far as political activism and other things. But uh, did it, did you take to it? right away? I, I would say so because, I mean, my opinion is my, my sister it does hilarious interpretations of me giving my opinion because she would usually say, you know, I don't care. She's six years older. She's very bourgeois and, you know, a princess. I don't care. And, you know, she'd get yelled at. My brother would go, I don't know, because he was quiet. And my father would say, you have to know something. And, you know, I would just say something like, well, I think that man should go over there and see what the kids are playing and just anything. And my father would go, well, that's, that's one way to look at it. And, <laughs> and my sister would go, that, that didn't make any sense. But it was a whole thing of ju just have an opinion. But like I said, I mean, everybody else drank the same water, but some of us responded differently to the water. Right. And I mean, again, what you just described almost, that was some drama in that. I mean, you were willing to go out there. Okay, an opinion is saying something that has a, a point of view, and I'll just go for it. I'm gonna, and so did you feel you were a little actor already? I didn't at all. I didn't discover acting until I was 16, really. But looking back, my siblings say, oh my God, you've always been an actor. You know, whatever you didn't want to do, you would suddenly have, you know, a big malaise and fall on the floor and, you know, you'd be blinded by a headache until the dishes were done. I don't remember that, though. <laughs> Interesting. But, you know, we got spanked back in the day. And she also said, huh. you know, when my sister was time for her to be spanked, we, and, you know, back then, neighbors looked after you as well as your family. So if you were over your friend's house and you broke a vase or you <coughs> did something, smoked a cigarette when I was six, uh, <laughs> then that, that parent would spank you, get a switch and spank everybody in the neighborhood that was there. You go home, your mother said, Stella told me she had to get you all today. Come on, you get spanked again and wait till your father gets home. And so it was this sort of ritualistic thing of, you got spanked, spanked a lot. So I guess at some point, my sister says, they would barely tap me and I would just cry and weep. But, and she said, you were acting then, you know, but we'd have to chase, the whole neighborhood would chase my sister because she refused to take a spanking. So you spent a lot of day, I mean, it, chasing each other to get spanked. But um, I think it probably, I don't think that I, I was acting to stop the spank. I think it hurt my feelings is what it was. So I think my feelings have always been kind of at the, 
near the surface. And I remember we were, we used to get my weekly reader mm -hmm. and it was about things that were happening around the world. And I remember sitting at the table and just starting to weep. I was probably about seven then. And my father, you know, rolled his eyes. My mother just went like, you know, don't go hard on her. And he said, what's the matter, baby? I said, uh, I read that 5,000 people died in a flood in India, you know. And my sister and my brother would just cackle and laugh. And my, you know, my father would say, stop it, stop it. And he goes, you know, go wash your face. You can't help anybody crying. You know, do your homework. Maybe you can be useful one day. <laughs> so, so I, again, talking mm -hmm. about how we feel each other, I think people that surrender to their artistic self, because I think we all have it in mm -hmm. spades, uh, are predisposed to be able to feel each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like a, a little bit of a Geiger kind of counter that you go towards something that's, uh, that's scalable in a way, that it's human, that there's something there to be done. And so I want to jump from there to the craft, where you revealed a little earlier that it was more in college that you studied acting and developed your craft. And was that an easy transition? That feel perfectly natural? Oh, yeah. And just yeah. Fast, because fast and furious? You, you know how, and everybody that's an artist in the, or in the audience, there's that thing when you're young, there is an energy inside you, and you don't know what it is. And I got checked for all kinds of things. I, I spent a, you know, worms, everything. It's like, what well, something is off about it. And I think it is that uh, there's in, in intuition in you that is that, and there's energy and movement in there that, that is connected, mm -hmm. is connected to other people in the world. And if you're lucky enough, somehow you get into a position where you, you, you can go flying across the room as a young man and go, yes, you, know, you, you have that energy. Um, or those words will come out of you, poets. But it's there, and if, if, if you aren't, if it isn't recognized in you or suspected in you by adults around you, uh, you get labeled a lot of other things. You don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I think um, it was, a, a harnessing and a focusing of something that was already in me, mm -hmm. as it was in you, mm -hmm. that uh, it, it's almost, uh, you're, you're so, it's a relief to channel it. It's a relief to give it boundaries and focus and a name and a discipline. So yes, you, when, when there is a possibility that you can put put words to the sounds that, that's coming out, coming through your head, it goes fast. And this was available to you and you got, did you feel like instantly recognized and well, I this never, is going to be my career? I mean, did you have that epiphany? I had that, I, I knew it's like, okay, I don't want to stop doing this because there was such a sense of freedom and right now, you know, frankly, there's a lot of being in the business because you're bringing something that is sacred into a very secular marketplace uh, in, on film and theater as well now. So there's t what makes you successful in the business is not at all what makes you uh, a good artist or a, a, a producer of a product that, that reaches people. So. Some of, the, some of the most talented artists, we never hear from them because they didn't have that other thing that could withstand the marketplace and how it demands and what it demands of you, which is antithetical to mm -hmm. come as you are. You've got to come authentic to your art or it isn't universal. So that same openness and authenticity, you bring it to Hollywood and they say, your nose is too big, you need to have some more breasts, you need some pecs, all of that. It's just, so it, it's, it's all of those things together, but now I'm off the subject of what you just asked me. Well, I was just asking, I mean, just whether, oh, it, whether it was instantly clear yeah, that so, this was gonna work. So you do all of that 
for, to me, you put up with all of that BS just for those moments between action and cut. There is such freedom and, and life and connectivity there in those moments. And mm. I must say, you don't do it to get recognized because part of the gig is you don't get recognized. You know, you have to be a person that's very comfortable with rejection because mm -hmm. it's constant. The biggest people are rejected every day. We might see the few things they're in or some flashy cameras going off, but that's not, you know, again, it takes, a, it's another characteristic to be able to be rejected. It doesn't mean you build up against it, it's just rejection has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Because you've already identified yourself, you own your voice, you own even the fact that uh, you know before anybody else tells you whether you, whether you played, whether you know before anybody applauds or not, or not. a maestro knows, a violinist knows. Mm -hmm. And it's nice if everybody agrees, but but you have, you have your that. own yeah. your own meter, yeah. And the truth is, this is very new of artists being recognized in their lifetime. The trip is, it's kind of, I don't know. It, it, it's artists have to work on themselves because they start to want to expect to be in. They expect to be and they want to be recognized in their lifetime. But it's a very new thing. Um, that separate and, and that and I mean that separating mm -hmm. an artist from a celebrity. Which is nothing yeah. wrong with being a celebrity, but the public needs to know that there's a difference. And unfortunately, the people that give money, put up money for dance projects, for anything, they, they don't know it. We've all bought into this culture of celebrity. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, on the recognition front, and we can safely say you're just wildly recognized. I mean, all the Emmys and the Grammy nomination, Oscar nomination, and all the awards. But I think when I look at the at your your career strictly on the on, as an actor, it's the it's the arc of it that I imagine that you're measuring. It's the length of the of the of the engagement with whether it's TV series or the engagement with with the craft itself. Um, is is that is that do I read that correctly, or do you actually? I mean, I have a feeling. I mean, I talked a little earlier, someone asked me from the audience, or, or I just decided to talk about it, um, that as a dancer, when I, I worked really hard to get to a place that, you know, I, I never thought I was done or anything, but, but then other things started to become more important, and then it became about how does this fit with other things? Uh -huh. Did that happen to you? Well, you know when you have dreams, it's always important to have dreams, but you can only dream as far as your horizon. So. The dream just sort of sets you in motion. Having, having a goal or having a point, it sets you in motion, but a person in motion is continuing to learn and to see things that they couldn't see. So you get different vantage mm -hmm. points. So uh, what I would say I set out to do when I left Tulsa to go and train at Boston University, it, I haven't done it. And there's part of me that still would like to do that, but I had no idea of all the other things that I could do. You, dis you discover it on the way, and it's not like you say, oh, you know what I can do with that? It's suddenly somebody turns and says, we gotta get downtown. They're arresting all the gay kids. And you don't even have time to think about it. You didn't say, oh, I'm gonna go do something, do some theater or something on the corner today. It's just like, if you are a human being, and as an artist, what you're doing is constantly taking away things is much more important than adding on things to get back to where you were as a child when your artistic and creative impulses were purer. And so uh, training the voice is usually not taking on training of the voice, it's getting away, tearing, pulling, back, pulling away those things. Getting down to the essential elements that are true. When, when we are... You know how, if you hear a kid that's two go, I won't screw your eye, ears up, and they go, Wah! they can just sh shriek. If we holler at one moment at a soccer match, our voice is, is hoarse here the, the next day. It's because everything that happens to us, everything we see becomes an emotion, 
stored emotionally in our body and muscle. Mm -hmm. And so people aren't born with nasality. They're just, babies don't talk like that. They, and some guys try to pitch their voices too low. So the training of the voice, when certain things happen, when your grandmom dies, that first person in your around nine or 10, all that gets stored. So the artist, the work of the artist is always trying to get back to neutrality of the actor. So it's taking away those things that we have put on mm -hmm. as, as, as uh, armor. So, Can I jump then, yeah. if I'm understanding you correctly, that you're, that applies to your sense of activism as well? That you just don't get in the way of it in some weird way? It's, you respond to your humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your humanity is there. And, and if, if, you're, if my work is to, um, is to tell people stories, is to inhabit a human being, to let their voice be heard, whether it is a, a, a fictional person or a person even that a, a writer has come up with, it is still somebody that that person knows. A fictional character is still, you know, our mind, our eye takes those pictures, you know, hundreds of thousands of pictures at a time. So everything we're, we're bringing forward, we're giving, it's, it's been, it has come into us before. So even in doing that, I don't understand, I don't see how it's possible to separate caring and, and having a responsibility for a human being or for human beings and being able to, to bring them to life but not feel them in their daily life, not respond to their, the quality of their lives. Mm -hmm. So you become a first responder in a way to being a neighbor. Whatever it is, a first responder towards justice. That's, okay. So let's tell me what your first real passion is. Well, I have to tell was. you this. It just yeah. made me think of this. One of my favorite quotes is Lorca, uh, Federico Garcia Lorca. And he says, uh, I'm paraphrasing, the song, the poem, the dance is but water drawn from the well of the people. Mm. We give it back to them in a cup of beauty that in drinking they may come to know themselves. And ever since we first stood up on two feet around a fire, what has happened is there's been a griot or whatever you want to call him, a, you know, the lore keeper, and that's been a sacred space for the tribe. That, that person mm -hmm. kept the lore of the tribe, kept the stories, and and you'd sit around, they, you know, basically holding the mirror up to the tribe so that they could see themselves. They could, uh, it would, some of the stories I'm sure were funny, make them laugh, reflect, whatever, just so that they could keep moving forward. It was always for the well-being of the tribe. I, I think that continues today. And that is, it is, uh, it's, it is service. It's a part of health to me. Uh, we enjoy it, but... We tell stories and we have always kept stories from the beginning um, to keep, to say, yes, we have been here. Yes, you know, to keep a record of the fact that we had being, but also to help us in a human way, in an interpersonal way, to navigate a way forward. Mm -hmm. Interpretation of a sort, to, to be the medium of it. I mean, I love that idea. I mean, the Lorca, that circle, that it comes from the people, but they don't actually know that it, it's theirs. That's it's an Emerson thing, too, about ah. genius. We, rec we recognize in genius our own rejected thoughts come back to us. <laughs> and it's that same thing that it, we know it, because it's, we could almost have done it, almost have felt it ourselves, but because we have. Yeah. It's, it's in our, in our... But we recognize we it. We recognize yeah. it. So tell me about the first real, I mean, was, was the, the, the fight for uh, equality in South Africa the first real activist thing for you, or was that just? No, that was. That was along the way. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you're very, you're very uh, identified with that as a co-founder. Of Artists for uh, New South Africa. It was Artists for Free South Africa. Before. Uh, before, before democracy. Yeah. But uh, probably, you know, I was aware of the situation in South Africa when I was in college, but it was also 
that, that time we were laying down on the trolley tracks in Boston uh, trying to stop the war. And this was in the early 70s. The, the cities had been on fire uh, with the assassination of uh, Malcolm and Bobby Kennedy and, and, and Martin Luther King. It was like, that was the last star. I was like, they shot the one that has said, you know, I'm all about love and brotherhood. And, and again, you know, women had found their voice, and, but we were still fighting about it because some women felt like, you know, they're strident, we shouldn't be like that. And so it was just, it was a crazy and wonderful time because you knew that you have to stir up the muddy riverbed, as the old folks tell us, for any kind of new action to come. And so it was, it was um, during that period, um, it was more focused, my and, and most young people's uh, attention was focused internally, but you were aware of South Africa. So it was after I left BU and, and things sort of settled there, except the Boston issue, uh, Boston busing issue uh, came to a head in 75, but I had gone to LA and so you start, you're trying to start your career, you're doing all those things, you're trying to get laid or not, and <laughs> all kinds of like, woohoo, you know, it was, it was party time and fabulous and wonderful time to be young. But again, you can only lay there for about an hour and you go, hmm, so, so I, we need to be doing something else. We, we'll lay out a couple of hours a day, but then we've got to get busy. We've got to be doing things. And that's when the, the South African, uh, um, the, the apartheid situation, as, as smoke started to clear on some of our situations, you, your eye was taken to, oh my God, this is going on and the history of it, knowing how long it had been going on. And so that was the impulse. I'm over here, thousands of miles away from there, but how can I be separated from it? That's the thing that keeps coming back. You cannot mm -hmm. separate yourself. Well, I can't separate myself from anything that happens anywhere. Because the thing about flying around the world is that you see that everybody eats rice. They put different flavor on it, you know, the Mujahideen has cousins that they love, just like, you know, the Democrats do. The, you know, people in the Shining Path also had children. I mean, it's, it's, it's that thing of understanding that it's, you just flavor up, you flavor up a human being by their circumstance. And if you want to engage with a human being, if, if you really are concerned about uh, you having well-being, and you can't have well-being if, if, if everybody around you doesn't have it. So, it's, so that's the great thing is we live long enough to keep trying it every day, hopefully until we drop. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I could not. And, and it's particularly the South African situation spoke to me so much because I felt this spiritual kinship to South Africa. I know we're mm -hmm. supposedly all from West Africa, the African Americans, uh, but I never felt that way about West Africa. I just, I, I could appreciate West Africa the way a person of Italian descent might, uh, an awake person of Italian descent might, it's like sort of social political understanding. But with South Africa, it was always very, um, very base, basic for me in my body. And I think it was because they, our movement here so mirrored the movement there. The Niagara Conference here happened in the teens that started the NAACP, was happening about the same time as the, the, uh, the People's Congress came together in the teens in South Africa. And, and they've always looked to the civil rights struggle in the states as a, as a sort of marker uh, of possibilities of strategies. And even during uh, apartheid, during the bu bus boycott, Montgomery bus boycott, they, they all started to walk to work there in a dominant culture. I mean, it was, there's this symbiote, uh, uh, symbi yeah. And then a uh, simpatico thing happening, the music drawing back and forth. So there's always been this thing. And even uh, white South Africans, cared more about what Americans thought of them than they did the rest of the world. I mean, that's why, to a certain extent, the sanctions movement works so well. And, and our, our job 
was to, and you have to stop me talking, because um, but our job was to uh, educate the American public, whether it was whatever you did in a community, whatever your job was, it was a grassroots effort all over the country to get people to understand, okay, the, the regime, yes, the, the, the European looking people, which we usually always side with in a conflict, they're actually not our people in this struggle. Mm -hmm. Our people, the democratic people, are the black and brown and the few white people who are, are working for democracy. So, so you that took became, that as your charge, essentially. Yeah, this is yeah. an, it's an information campaign. It's a, it's, a, it's a way to turn the tide of public opinion, essentially. Yes, yes, and help Ron Dellums get the, the sanctions bill passed on the floor of the Congress. Also, because the American public is a big-hearted Mm -hmm. group of people. We are the biggest hearted people in the world, trust me. We are, you know, person yes. to person, Americans will give you the shirt off their back. They will run to the defense of somebody that's screaming. So it's, it's when we don't have full information that we, we don't seem to, to work well as a society coming to people's aid. So um, what we did was we went straight to the leadership, the, the people who were banned, underground, the Tambos, Madiba, and then while they were still on the island, mm -hmm. we went to them and said, how can we be of assistance rather than making it up your, yourself? And that's another thing is that um, when you want to help people, it's best to ask them, what can I do to help you? Rather than, hey, I've got a great idea, yeah. you know, because you're not in that situation, <laughs> so you don't know how to be of help. So that's how we established that relationship through the years. I see. And I see you're wearing uh, Nelson um, Mandela. There. Yeah. Did you meet him? Uh, at what point did you come into contact? Um, you know, we, Danny Glover and I did a movie for HBO called Mandela. And again, that this effort was to uh, to put a human face because he was just called a terrorist then, and you just saw little blips from him from the BBC. Um, also back then, Reuters, AP, UPI, they were all in South Africa, but they weren't allowed to report the news out of there by the government. So back then, it was fax machines, guys. We'll explain what that is. So the Washington office on Africa and uh, TransAfrica would get faxes every day from people on the ground in South Africa saying, this is who has been uh, detained. This is who has disappeared. This is who has been killed. And it was the names of people where hotspots were. And so we would go to the Washington Post or uh, LA Times or New York Times, and they wouldn't print it because it wasn't coming from the official source. Yeah, yeah, it was coming from black people and crazy white people in South Africa <laughs> to black people in DC. It was like, you know, sorry, we can't. So then, what we did this is one of our first things was if actors want to hold a news conference, they will come, it'll be talking about your cellulator, I'm, I'm engaged. If a celebrity wants, a, 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 you know, they can bring the camera. So what we would do, we had a big meeting. I put out a bunch of faxes all around the business and just said, anybody interested on the situation in South Africa, come to Bob, uh, Bob Guillaume and Donna Guillaume, Donna Brown Guillaume's house. About 400 people showed up. People were hanging off the walls. There were editors, actors, secretaries, you know, the people that bring the ice to the studio. And so that's how we actually formed artists for uh, uh, New South Africa, then a Free South Africa. And so um, what we did was to take our ability, our whole, our, working in our community, but our whole community was the nation because we're in people's um, homes every night on TV and things like that, and, and just do grassroots work in forming. And so we would have press conferences getting that material out. We always have an Africa expert with us, and, and so we were, we were, we were, it was an activist organization. Mm -hmm. And we, over the years, we probably raised about $12 million that we never kept any of it. It went straight to South African uh, nonprofits on the, on the ground that we thought were effective. So it sounds to me like that grassroots organization, which you, know, you experienced as a kid knocking on doors, uh, trying to get out the vote. It's, it's just, it just takes on other forms as it goes along. So then it's rallying the Hollywood community uh, and seeing how you can actually pinpoint your own talents 
to that. So let's jump to education now, where we're, we're lucky enough to work together on Turnaround Arts and other projects, Art Strike in LA. You came and did one of those with me at Inner City Arts. Uh, and the, the challenge is quite different. I, though it still is, there's a public opinion element, certainly, about that. We discussed that earlier with Howard about, you know, why does, why does arts education as a, as, a, as a genre of education not get the, uh, the same cred? and some of its misunderstanding, some of its competition things. But, you know, we had a question earlier from one of the young poets from, from Carlin that uh, she said, um, we didn't get to answer, what about a school where kids really are just going to survive? They're there just to kind of try and get through. Am I paraphrasing correctly? Um, and, you know, we've seen schools like this. Uh, but what do you think about in that? I mean, I, I, can, I can set you off probably because I know that you're really a, a humanist in, the, in, the, in a one sense of the word, that you look for the human being and think, what can we do? But that challenge is many fold, where you've got kids who you know, are, are, are not being given adequate resource, essentially. So why should they try? You know, they're just there to survive. What's your reaction when you, when you think about that? Well, it, it, it makes me angry that that situation exists. First of all, I'm, I'm flabbergasted, then I get angry, and then I, I get nervous about what it means. And one of the things that I know that cures all of that is to get busy. Mm -hmm. You can't cure it all. And most people are, um, what do you call it? They're shut down or stymied. They, they become immobile because they get overwhelmed about, about problems. But the thing is, you, you, you choose a point, you head for it, you do your one thing, you hopefully infect other people, they do one thing. I mean, that's the thing. I think the reason that it all just doesn't go to hell in the handbasket right now is that just as all of those, as those unjust situations are, are uh, existing, there are people trying every day, sometimes uh, failing at it, but the important thing is that the energy is going towards trying to do something about it. That's why I do what I do, is because I can't believe, you know, and I paid a lot of money for my children, and thank God I was able to do it, to go through school. I had paid more by the time they started preschool. I had paid more in those first three years before they even got to kindergarten than my entire college education cost because I couldn't let them go to the LA Unified Schools. Now, yeah, that's rich lady problems. But the thing is, I'm grateful that I could do that, but that means I also have a double responsibility that I gotta keep trying to do something to fix it for everybody else's kids. They can't afford to do that. And I'm saying rich lady, even just working class people in, in LA, the situation is so bad that people take out multiple loans just to get their kids into some kind of parochial school, anything, because, because of the, that broken school district. The last thing I'm gonna say, and then I'm gonna go back to what you said. When I, went to, when I moved to California 40 years ago, California had the top schools in the nation 40 years ago, and probably about 36 years, 35 years ago, we had a Proposition 13 uh, that cut funding. It was a property tax thing. And the, of course, when they started to cut the funding, the arts, education, yeah, education all around. General, yeah. But, you know, that is within 30 years. No, because we've been struggling now for 20 years. Within 20 years, we went from the top school system in the nation to you wouldn't believe. I think we might be about three up from Louisiana, something like that. But that's what happens. Okay, so back to this. So, so th the thing is, everybody deserves a place to go that's safe, that there are people there who are interested in what they have to say, that people care what's gonna happen to them the next day, the next year, and 10 years from now. Um, everybody deserves that. The only thing that we have found, and there's people, there's all kinds of, there's Teach for America, there's A plus schools, there's all these different entities that are working to try to do something to fix the schools. Um, 
But in the meantime, one of the things that we have found that, it, that really uh, goes quickly, a long way and quickly, on not much money, is integrating arts into the curriculum. Um, if it's a school where people just don't want to show up because the, the, the community is depressed around it, you know, life is depressed, having that thing that's not a playtime, but is a moment of self-expression that you need even more so when you don't have a voice and your parents don't even have a voice, mm -hmm. that moment of expression in a day for an hour is enough to make you say, you know what? I'm going to school. You know what? I'm going to listen right now. Be quiet. I'm trying to work on my trombone. You know, just it, it, it changes behavior in our schools. We've seen mm -hmm. that. The I mean, there's a, there's a, there's one thing I'd say too. And I am really never, I'm never comfortable saying, it's the arts. That's what it is. I often say to a, a friend of mine who's a big supporter and, and an activist for dance education in schools, just very focused on dance. And I say, let them read too. Um, and I think about that sometimes about what we're advocating here is that you guys want to go to school. And that, if that's, you know, I've, I've read about ABCs, athletic, band, and chorus makes kids want to come to school. They want to come for the game. They want to come to be in the band. They want to come to be in the chorus. There's like a thing that you're a part of beyond simply what like Little Buck described earlier, like they gave you the work and you have to give the back the work. Mm -hmm. not, that, not a great incentive system on that unless you really are either excelling at the work already, lucky enough to have that incentive, or perhaps uh, you have an example in your family. You've got the path in your mind, but so much of the time what you're describing when we see it is that those pathways aren't there, and that leads nowhere. There's no pathway. You don't go anywhere. You don't know how it's going to happen to you. So you have to get at it maybe from another way. And maybe that's, that's those, those ABCs. That's where there's something else that's there. That's you guys with your poetry. It's, it's, uh, it's a thing that involves you on another level that makes you part of a community, right? Right. And it, cr it creates community. Art, being, being expressive, being, it, it's, again, it goes back to we are all tribal people. The tribe is just now the whole planet, but it creates fellowship and it creates connectiveness and, mm -hmm. and that's what's missing. And do you, when you use the word responsibility, do you feel that it's an artist's responsibility to be an activist in some way, to be fully aware, to have your, you know, that, uh, this great letter from Martha Graham to Agnes DeMille telling her to keep the channel open, you gotta be open. Is that part of that responsibility? I think. Or is it individual? I don't know if it's a responsibility or a characteristic of really being, uh, really honoring your art, is that it goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. It's already there. So uh, the people that just go to their cubicle or go sit by a pool or whatever they do are. And, and they don't think past it. You, you, you see it in their work. You know, you see the difference in people's involvement in the world, no matter what their business is. You see the difference in their product mm -hmm. when they have a worldview, a city view. When I say a, wor a worldview, I'm just talking about a city. You don't have to go to Zimbabwe and Uganda, like, mm -hmm. you know, and shout at Museveni, like, you know, we've done in the past year. But in your city, there are kids that, that don't know how to read. You can establish a relationship there. There are, there are seniors who just need somebody to come pick up the whatever and take it over there or say hello. to. So activism isn't necessarily being in the line, literally, of the bullets. Activism is, is being a neighbor. And a neighbor, it's, you know, it's still your neighbor if they're around the world, if you're Malala, but it also means, why do I keep passing this school, and I am a professional woman, and I haven't gone in there to just say, can I talk to the seventh grade girls? Mm -hmm. And just say to them, you know what? I used to sit in a desk just like that, and, and I was 
you know, daydreaming most time. I was writing my name like Mrs. So-and-so, like I was the, for the cutest boy in the class. So they just need to know that there's a way to, that there's a road from where they are to where they might want to be. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I thought we would take a few questions. Uh, we have microphones in the room, so if you want to raise your hand, the mic will come to you. Uh, why don't we start with the gentleman right there? And then we're going to come down here after that. So if you want to bring that mic down here, that'd be great. Do you mean to ask me questions about things that makes me very intense? You guys, I'm not really this intense all the time. <laughs> Please, go ahead. Thank you. I run a charity for disadvantaged youth that uses sports to create social activism or more social justice. And so I go to a lot of conferences where people are always thinking sports is the way to get kids to be more creative, more connected. And listening to you as artists, I'm sure you go into those same spaces where people are saying that without the arts, the, it's proven and the science shows and all of that. And I, I've been trying to break down the barriers. It's not sports, it's not arts. It's really the mentoring. It's the giving them the opportunity to learn how to find their voice to speak out and create change. And I just wondered your opinions on that. Well, I, as I said a moment ago, I am I'm, I, I always strive not to be exclusionary and say, no, it's not that, it's this. I think that all of the full rounded education is what I'm hoping for. That's the education I hope for, for young people. And that involves athletics, that involves arts, that involves all of the, the opportunities that you know, we can actually imagine for, for kids. So the problems occur, of course, when there's a comp competition for, for time and value. But what you described as mentorship I describe as showing the path. And finding voice, what you describe, is something I've seen, Alfred, you do so, you know, kind of magically in schools where, you know, uh, you'll be in a classroom, let's say the, the Lame Deer Montana, where they really aren't terribly responsive, frankly, just not willing to share because it's not part of what they do on a daily basis. And to get them actually to tell their story finally tell their story was, is just a huge step forward to finding voice, which means finding your path. And I find that that's the key in the end, finding engagement, getting the participatory element to happen. And it can be arts, it can be athletics, it can be uh, a number of things, but to my mind, the, the one thing that I'd say is that the arts integrate into all of it. They integrate into the human soul, into our availability to understand. They integrate into our participation and our teamwork. They integrate into all of it in a way that I don't think there is anything else there. I think what you described again, when you have those images, standing up by the campfire and being told the story of your people is something very special that, that does not happen in athletics, actually. <laughs> it's, it's just not there. So not to get competitive, but that's my answer. Is this? Yeah, you're on. Uh, my question is, you're an amazing actress and, and you have become like really renowned and stuff, but you seem so humble. And, and I've seen people that's not nowhere near, the, uh, hasn't done anywhere, anything near the quality of work you've done, but they get really arrogant and whatnot. And as an, aspire act, as an aspire, aspiring actor myself and an artist, I wanna know like what makes you so humble and, and like how you can get so up there but still remain, you know, still down here? Um, maybe it's because my father said to me all the time, from the time I was little, there's no man ever above you and there's no man ever beneath you. It's, that's the whole thing, it's like, just that, when you teach a child there's nobody above them, when you're trying to encourage them, that's very important, but you also have to really let a child know, and by the way that they walk to my parents, is that nobody is beneath you. So I feel like all of us have to be, whether we're making software, whether we're designing clothing, Whenever you think of what you're doing as being in service, it changes the, 
the product that you're putting out, but it also changes the quality of your days. Even if you're in a shitty job and it's like, I just got it for now, then in that moment, connect when you're making the burger. Hey, give that burger to a human being. I mean, it's just, it changes. Hmm. That's the thing we do have control over is the power of our thought and our intention. And so I think with me is that I feel grateful I discovered something that I can pay my rent for to be among the family of men. It happened to be as a storyteller. Well, if, as I'm bringing people's story, as I find an individual and study them, it is very humbling. And I can't authentically do that if I'm not gonna be authentically in my belly, in my bottom to go there. I've gotta be there with that person. And if you do that kind of work, you have to be changed by it. And you cannot walk around the street like you're something else. If you wanna walk around the street like you're something else, you can do that, that's fine. Everybody does the best they can. So those people that live up there doing all that, they're, 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 that's their walk, that's the best they can do. But they're never gonna be able to give you a portrait of a young man or a young woman as a human being. And you just make the decision which one you wanna do. One, you sleep well at night and you, you feel pretty good. Um, the other, you, people, people uh, exalt you because of shiny, shiny things. And you decide if that feels better. Hmm. All right, on a lighter note, <laughs> I don't know, that just got me like intense. I love the movie Crooklyn. Like that is my all-time favorite movie. Do you have like any special moments in that movie or anything that you would love to share with me? Okay, I'll tell you this. Uh, Spike is so, he's so interesting. I could talk forever about Spike, but uh, you know the scene where they don't clean up the kitchen? Right, oh yeah. And the mom, this is Crooklyn, Spike Lee's movie. And she's told them, she's got like five kids, I think. And you know, it, it's kind of a autobiographical for a neighborhood and it's summertime and it's in the 70s and the music is great and all, but um, she, she, uh, she te tells them, you know, she's, she's a tough mom and she's telling them what to do all the time, but there's a lot of love in the household. Well, they don't clean up. And she had said, you know, she's tired. It's like two o'clock in the morning and she goes in and she just, she wakes him up, she drags him out of bed, get your butt ass downstairs and all. Spike let me improvise all of that. And so yeah, so that was really fun. And I, I had the five kids over a two month period and it was summertime, so they, they should have been out playing. Their moms are like, oh, they're in a movie, I'm just gonna sit and have a Coke. So I really was having to deal with these kids and they would, if they had fights, they'd come and say, Alfred, no, he said, I don't know. and I said, stop it, stop it. You know, so so I, we had to cut sometimes because sometimes Spike was behind the camera laughing so hard. I was saying like, you know, I, I will knock the black off you. I'll knock you in it. And I'm just screaming so much. That's one of the fun things about being an actress. You always have to, well, if you're a young Southern woman, you're told from the time you're three, be nice. Be nice, you know, you know, we have to laugh at everybody else's stuff, but being an actor, you can just be bad, and you can cut up and it's all good. Mm. Um, Do we, we have, have one more? We have time for one more question. Um, right. Oh, I'm sorry, we okay. have it right here. So maybe we'll do two more quickly. Okay. And I'll make oh. it short. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna try to make it short as well. Um, you guys talked about how the, the responsibility of being an artist and an activist at the same time and how those can be two different entities, but what, a, what do you guys think about the response of the idea um, of turning your art into activism being a responsibility as well? Hmm. Oh, I don't think that that is a responsibility as much as a gift. Some people are more predisposed to it of whatever their art form is. And so that's, it, it's not their responsibility, that's part of their art form. It's you know a continuation of it. Some people make decisions about their activism. Uh, as, a, as a woman, 
what kind of roles am I really going to say no to? It, 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 there's all, there's as many different, as there are artists and as there are fingerprints, there's those many different ways to approach it. And I'd also point out that there's uh, covert and overt hmm. activism in art. <laughs> there is art that actually exists on its own merits and is an artistic product that has a tremendous activist uh, sensibility. It, it can change the world type thing, even though it's not meant to be activism. We're not going to make set out to make that happen. And I can tell you some examples about that. But uh, there's a very interesting difference between those. Uh, just there's this one thing. There's wonderful uh, ballet created by George Balanchine, great Russian-born choreographer, founded the New York City Ballet, my company, called Agon, 1957, height of you know, civil rights struggle is happening, unbelievable things, little girls being stoned. And he creates a ballet to Stravinsky, modernist music, no costume, stripped down, black and white, and he casts uh, uh, the first African-American principal ballet dancer, Arthur Mitchell, uh, in the lead role with Diana Adams, Caucasian ballerina, in a pas de deux that you could describe as uh, uh, sensual in a way, but certainly a grappling of uh, a, a, a sort of uh, it, it, it's, it, it's just groundbreaking, and it is not touted as, here we are, we're doing something really important here. We've got Arthur Mitchell and Diana Adams. It simply was the art itself in the context of its time, and it was something just mm -hmm. stupendous. And it wasn't, it wasn't even, it, it achieved the goal without being that, you know, which is really interesting. Without being didactic. Without being didactic, and, and on the contrary, yeah. Um, I am actually, one last yeah, one quick one, because there's something very special surprise, actually, we don't want to miss okay. on time. So. In this last question, I might get you crying again. Uh-oh. Uh, recently, the world lost a phenomenal woman in Dr. Maya Angelou, and I was wondering, did you s share any time with her um, in your lifetime, and if so, if you could share that story with us? Oh, let's see, I'd have to, I'd have to reach for that, but uh, yes. Dr. Maya, who always said to me, Alfred, call me Maya. I said, mm-mm, I'm -mm, calling you Maya. <laughs> so so I, I called her Miss Maya. But um, she directed me in a play, in a movie called uh, Down in the Delta, and with uh, Esther Roll, Al Freeman Jr., Wesley, Wesley Snipes, uh, Loretta Devine. Um, and then I, I've spent time with her at her home um, in Winston-Salem. and. It wasn't the big conversations, because you don't have those conversations with people like Maya and with people like Madiba. With Madiba, I could have political conversations, but what you do is you have people talk, because that's what they don't get to do, mostly, because everybody sees them as icons. So, so uh, I'm trying to think of one that I actually could share with you, but. It was about being an artist, actually, a woman artist who was also a devoted mother and, and, a, and a woman in the world doing the mm -hmm. things that we're doing. And she told me, she said, you have to recognize that there are something different about you than everybody else. She said, we always, we have to recognize that because if, if we don't recognize that in ourselves, we can do all the other things, but we've got to basically cut ourselves some slack about some things because we are artists. And that is, that's, that's a lot to carry in a lifetime. So that was incredible. Would you, would you, I asked you if you'd read something. And okay, Damien read. asked me to read something. And I love poetry. I love all kinds. I love, lo love poetry. I love Emily Dickinson. I love Langston Hughes. I love everybody. But I, just because it was, uh, we were talking about activism and art today, I love Sonia Sanchez. So this is, a, this is something that when I read it when I was, you know, 
17, I just, you know, it, again, a, a good artist, whether it's music, words, dance, will put words or motion to something that you have been feeling but you had no way to make it intelligible. Okay, she calls it for sweet honey. I am going to stay on the battlefield. I am going to stay on the battlefield. I am going to stay on the battlefield till I die. I am going to stay on the battlefield. I am going to stay on the battlefield. I am going to stay on the battlefield till I die. I had come into the city carrying life in my eyes amid rumors of death, calling out to everyone who would listen it is time to move us all into another century. Time for freedom and racial and sexual justice. Time for women and children and men. Time for hands unbound. I had come into the city wearing peaceful breasts and the spaces between us smiled. I had come into the city carrying life in my eyes. I had come into the city carrying life in my eyes. And they followed us in their cars with their computers and their tongues crawled with caterpillars and they bumped us off the road, turned over our cars and they bombed our buildings, killed our babies and they shot our doctors maintaining our bodies and their courts changed into confessionals. But we kept on organizing. We kept on teaching, believing, loving, doing what was holy, moving to a higher ground, even though our hands were filled with slaughtered teeth. But we held out our eyes, delirious with grace. We held out our eyes, delirious with grace. I'm gonna stay on the battlefield. I'm gonna stay on the battlefield. I am gonna stay on the battlefield till I die, till I die. Come, I say, you sitting in domestic bacteria. Come, I say, you standing still in double-breasted mornings. Come, I say, come and return to the fight. This fight for the earth. This fight for our children. This fight for our life. We need your hurricane voices. We need your sacred hands. I say, come, sister, brother, to the battlefield. Come into the rainforest. Come into the hood. Come into the barrio. Come into the schools, into the abortion clinics, into the prisons. Come and caress our spines. I say, come, wrap your feet around justice. I say, come, wrap your tongues around truth. I say, come, wrap your hands with deeds and prayer. You brown ones, you yellow ones, you gay ones, you white ones, you lesbian ones, come, 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 come to this battlefield. Come to this battlefield. Call life. Call life. Call life. I am going to stay on the battlefield. I am going to stay on the battlefield. I am going to stay on the battlefield till I die. Till I die. I am going to stay on the battlefield. I am going to stay on the battlefield. I am going to stay on the battlefield till I die. Yeah. And I will see all of you young ones there. <laughs>